Hello, BioTheory. Mr. Walker here. I'm going to start this lesson by backing it up to Biology 20 and refreshing your memory a little bit on this process here, cellular respiration. Remember, cellular respiration is what is taking place inside, well, of your cells. And uh, what your cells do require is oxygen. They require glucose. And what they are producing, carbon dioxide and water. So keep in mind that the overall purpose of this reaction is to make the usable form of energy that's responsible for all of the energy requiring processes in your cells. And that is the production of adenosine triphosphate or ATP. So what that means, of course, is that you need to take in oxygen through your respiratory system and you need to take in glucose. And this, of course, is through your digestive system. So that's why the title for this lesson is Regulation of the Absorptive. So when you do take food into your mouth, you start to break it down, passes down through your stomach, your intestines, and it is there that you absorb the building blocks of fats, carbohydrates, and proteins, crossing the lining of your small intestine, and then entering your blood. And then what happens after that too, with the well glucose that we're gonna focus on, but also amino acids and fatty acids, is um, a change in the amount of these levels in your blood, and that's the post-absorptive state that I'll be talking about as well. So yeah, just as I mentioned, after you do eat a meal, things that you're breaking down, this is a polysaccharide, the proteins, the fats, these are macromolecules. You do need to break them down into their building blocks before they can be absorbed. So in the case of carbohydrates, that is monosaccharides, of which we're going to talk about glucose, the amino acids that proteins are built up from, and fatty acids and glycerol that most fats are made from. So after you eat a meal, there's going to be, yes, an increase in the level of all of these in your blood after they are digested and absorbed. And if you haven't eaten for a period of time, of course, you're going to get the opposite. So fasting, it doesn't have to be months of fasting. It can be just a few hours without eating where you're going to get a drop in these same levels. So it is going to be really the glucose that we are going to be focusing on here. The pancreas is the major organ that we'll be discussing in terms of glucose homeostasis in your blood. And what your pancreas can do for one thing is it can measure the levels of glucose in your blood. So it is the detection organelle for this. Not only does it detect it, it is going to respond in the way by producing two different hormones. And these hormones, their function is going to be to maintain homeostasis in terms of the blood glucose. So we've seen these prefixes before, hyper means high, hypo means low, neither are good. You want blood homeostasis for the blood glucose concentration. Numbers that we use here are in units of milli moles per liter, and I'll give you kind of a broad range. Normal range if someone um, has normal homeostasis and is able to regulate their blood glucose is somewhere between about four and seven millimoles per liter. So high blood glucose will be prolonged up above the seven millimoles per liter, and low blood glucose would be prolonged below the four millimoles per liter. This first hormone here is the most important hormone for blood glucose regulation. You probably heard of this one. This one is insulin. You need to know very specifically that insulin is not only produced by the pancreas, but it is produced by a cluster of cells scattered throughout the pancreas, the islets of Langerhans, and even more specifically within these clusters, there are cells that are referred to as the pancreatic beta cells. Those are the ones that can do two things. First of all, they measure the blood glucose. So they respond to high levels of blood glucose following a meal, and they secrete insulin into the blood. So kind of think of it like this. If this is our pancreatic beta cell, they have receptors sticking out of their surface. These receptors are specific for glucose. So after a meal, if this is glucose and it is circulating around, 
it's going to bind to those receptors. When the glucose does bind to those receptors, the more glucose binding to these receptors, the more stimulus we're going to have of the pancreatic beta cells, and the more insulin is going to be produced. So insulin, just like all of the other hormones, it is transported through the blood. It circulates around until it finds its targets. And in the case of insulin, it's many of the cells within your body that are going to have receptors for the insulin to attach to. So when that insulin does attach to these receptors on your body cells, it does two things that are really important for you to remember. The first thing is it makes those cells more permeable to glucose. That's one of the two big things that you need to know. So what does that mean? Glucose needs to get into your cells. That is where cellular respiration takes place. And the way that it gets into the cells is by opening up a gate. And that gate needs to be opened up by insulin attaching to receptors on the cells of your body. Once that glucose is taken up by your cells, it can be used for cellular respiration, but chances are after a meal, you have way, 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 way more than what you actually need at the time. So what your body does, what your cells do, and some cells do this better than others, is they take some of that glucose and they convert it into the carbohydrate storage form which is called glycogen. What glycogen really is, is just a whole bunch of glucose molecules all linked together in straight and branching chains. And that is how we as animals store carbohydrate in our bodies. And we can store it in many of the cells, but there are a couple of major, major organs and tissues in your body where it is stored, and that is in your skeletal muscles. You store huge amounts of glycogen and also in your liver you store huge amounts of glycogen so we would say that these are the major storage reservoirs for carbohydrates specifically glycogen in your bodies so after you have eaten a meal and uh, you've digested it you've broken it down the blood glucose is increased you bring that blood glucose down by using the insulin eventually that blood glucose well is going to drop if it does drop, well, that means you no longer have that glucose circulating around to bind to the receptors on the beta cells. You're no longer stimulating the beta cells. You've removed that. So now that secretion is going to drop. We also have a negative feedback here. So when we do have the insulin that is circulating around, it is going to feed back to the pancreatic beta cells, and it's going to serve as a negative feedback. Again, we want to maintain not only the blood glucose, but we want to maintain the ideal amount of insulin. So if there is enough circulating around, you don't need any more, uh, there will be receptors on the beta cells that will allow that insulin to attach to it. And again, it's regulating its own production once you do have a sufficient amount. We'll come back and talk about this later, the big condition related to the inability to regulate blood glucose, and that is diabetes mellitus. So this is related to insulin and either the lack of insulin production or even if it is produced maybe it just doesn't work so it's not all that terribly effective so those individuals they do lose their blood glucose regulation the glucose cannot be taken up by cells it cannot be taken up by cells in the absence of insulin so these individuals can have enormous blood glucose levels but their cells are starving because it cannot get into the cells. And what that also means that we'll see is that if it remains in the blood, the blood is eventually filtered by the kidneys. Your kidneys would normally pull back all of that glucose, but if there's too much in the blood, your kidneys can't pull it all back. So what ends up happening is a whole bunch of the glucose ends up in the urine. If you are non-diabetic, that should not be the case. If you are diabetic, that may very well be the case. The second hormone that is produced by the pancreas are the, or rather is glucagon, and this one is still produced by these clusters of cells, only it's a different group of cells, and they are the pancreatic alpha cells. And you should remember that, insulin by the beta cells, glucagon by the alpha cells, and please don't confuse this word here, glucagon, with a very similar word that we just saw, which is glycogen. Glycogen is, again, the carbohydrate storage form, glucagon on is a hormone really does the opposite so insulin responded to 
high blood glucose, glucagon is produced when there is low blood glucose. The major effects are really going to be opposite that of insulin and specifically what it's going to do is take that glycogen that was stored and now it's going to break it down. So increased glycogen breakdown and here it is specifically going to target the liver. Again, that's one of the two major storage reservoir, reservoirs in your body for glycogen and the glucagon is going to target the liver and there's going to be another hormone that's going to be a little bit more specific for the muscles and that is this one here that we've seen before, epinephrine or adrenaline. It does in this sense in terms of the glycogen and the glucose the same thing as the glucagon, only this one is specific for muscles. And as we already know, it is produced by the inner gland or the inner portion of the adrenal gland, which is called the adrenal nebula. And keep in mind, we've encountered a number of other hormones that also have an impact on blood glucose, cortisol, meaning uh, maintaining blood glucose levels, thyroxin is involved, and growth hormone is involved, norepinephrine, very similar to epinephrine, also involved in blood glucose regulation. So this picture here kind of summarizes what we did just talk about. So in the center here, what you have is our homeostasis that we're trying to maintain in terms of blood glucose. Again, somewhere around 4 to 7 millimoles per liter. After you eat a meal, post-meal, what do you get? Well, you get a huge increase in blood glucose. What does that glucose do? It goes around, it finds the pancreatic beta cells, and the pancreatic beta cells are going to increase the production and release of insulin. What does that insulin do? Circulates around to all of the tissues in your body, but two of the major ones are going to be the liver cells and the muscle cells. What does the insulin do? makes these cells more permeable so the glucose can get into these cells and then it also takes the glucose and stores it in the form of glycogen same thing over here takes the glucose and stores it in the form of glycogen and then you haven't eaten for a while so what happens while well, your blood glucose is now going to be going down you're no longer going to stimulate those pancreatic beta cells. Now what you're going to do is stimulate the alpha, alpha cells. They're going to increase the production of glucagon. Glucagon circulates around. Its primary target is going to be the liver and it really just reverses what we did just see taking place with the insulin, releasing that glucose, allowing it to get into the blood where it can be taken up by cells and used for cellular respiration. What about the muscles? Well, usually we're going to have that uh, gly glycogen that is broken down by having the stimulus coming from the hormonal stimulus from epinephrine. Again, that one is produced by the adrenal medulla. And remember, this is a stress hormone. So if you think something fairly simple and straightforward, physical exercise, this is a stress situation. When you're exercising, your muscle cells, of course, need that glucose for cellular respiration to make ATP and continue to contract. So during this stress situation, the exercise, epinephrine will be produced by the adrenal medulla. Epinephrine will increase, be circulating through the blood, will find its target tissue, the muscles, and it will take that glycogen, convert it into the glucose. You don't even need to move it into the blood. It's already in the muscles where it can be used directly for cellular respiration. <clears throat> so I said we'd be coming back to diabetes. This one here, diabetes mellitus. Diabetes does mean running through, and what we're really talking about is urine, urine production, and it's also sweet. So I did mention that if there is too much glucose in the blood, it cannot be reabsorbed by the nephrons, or it can't all be reabsorbed by the nephrons. So a bunch of it does end up uh, passing through and being in the urine, which would normally not be the case if someone is non-diabetic. So keeping that in mind, signs are something that you see, symptoms are something that the person tells you, someone that is diabetic, what could you expect? Frequent urination. Sugar in the urine. Losing a lot of this energy, so low energy levels.
they're losing a lot of fluid, thirst. They want to replace that fluid. So these would be some of the typical things that we uh, would see if someone is diabetic. So how do they diagnose if someone is diabetic? Well, they will monitor their blood glucose, monitor their blood glucose when they've been fasting, after a meal, see if there are huge fluctuations, which there simply shouldn't be. It shouldn't be changing all that terribly much and again should remain within that range of approximately four to seven millimoles per liter. They can also do what is called the A1C test and that takes a look at an average blood glucose over not just uh, one day, but a much longer period of time over several months to kind of get a feel for if someone does have prolonged high levels of blood glucose. And as we'll see, that is what really does create the problem. So we'll talk about some different classifications, at least three anyway at this point, different classifications of diabetes. And I'll mention one other one, which might be another different category or classification of diabetes. So the first one here, type one diabetes, this is a primarily genetically based one. People will eventually develop it typically early on, and that's why it's also referred to as early onset or juvenile onset diabetes. Most people that are diabetic do not have this kind of diabetes. It's only about one in 10 or 10% of the population that have type one diabetes. This is the one where there is a problem with the pancreatic beta cells. They are defective. There's something wrong with them. And because of that, they are not producing insulin. You need to have insulin to survive. Otherwise, you can't get close in yourself. So it is genetic, but it's actually fairly complicated. It's not just a one single gene, possibly the gene associated with insulin production. There can be many, many, many different possible genes that are related to the inability to properly regulate blood glucose. It is now recognized as an autoimmune disease. And what that means is that their immune system made a mistake. It attacked and destroyed their own cells. And in this case, it just happens to be the ones that are responsible for producing. So, first of all, environmental factors usually tied into the genetic factors as well. So maternal weight gain during pregnancy, that might be a risk factor. And here we're talking about for the baby when it is born. Uh, of course, females always will be gaining weight when they are pregnant, but if there is excessive weight gain, uh, weight gain, that may have an impact on the fetus later on in life. Viral infections, they're discovering that this is more and more linked to diseases all of the time. So someone may have, for example, a genetic predisposition and only upon exposure to a certain infection does that result in the immune system making a mistake leading to autoimmunity and possibly exposure to uh, certain allergens as well. It may be a trigger. So what can happen to someone to lead to significant problems and even death if we are talking about type one diabetes? Well, these people, they do need insulin injections. This has to be the case. They cannot live without the insulin injections. So gluco is not available. Your body doesn't want to starve to death. So what it does is it actually starts to break down other things like proteins and fats. And that does result in the production of ketones and acidification of tissues in your body, ketoacidosis, which does create some problems like going into a diabetic coma. Increased glucose can have um, severe consequences then. And if you are eliminating a whole bunch of glucose, as we'll see, that can lead to severe dehydration. And that in itself can be the cause of death. So if we kind of follow this sequence here, decrease insulin production means that there's a whole bunch more glucose in the blood, which means you're excreting a whole bunch of that glucose in the urine. As a general rule, wherever this goes, this is gonna follow. So in addition to using, losing the glucose, again, you're losing a whole bunch of body fluids. Uh, most of your body is water, most of your blood is water, so you're going to have a decrease in the plasma volume, decrease in cardiac output, and decrease in blood pressure. If you can't circulate enough blood up to your brain because you have low blood pressure, well, that can ultimately lead to brain damage, coma, and death. So again, this does need to be controlled, type 1 diabetes, with insulin injections.
What are some other consequences associated with? And what this is really with is not necessarily just diabetes, but not being able to properly regulate your blood glucose. And this is really with prolonged high levels of blood glucose over uh, years. What can it lead to? Well, first of all, in the short term, it can lead to some problems if you do have um, high blood glucose, the ketoacidosis that we mentioned, uh, that can lead to rapid breathing, nausea, a decreased a level of consciousness. So in this case, these people can be quite deceiving. Um, it may just appear as if, well, maybe they've had a little bit too much to drink and they're drunk because someone that is drunk, they might be nauseous. They have a decreased level of consciousness. Someone that is diabetic and someone that has ketoacidosis, it looks very similar. Long term, major problems with not regulating your blood glucose. Prolonged levels of hyperglycemia over the years can lead to high blood pressure. That is linked to cardiovascular disease, heart attack, and stroke. Can lead to damage to the nephrons in the kidneys, kidney disease. The kidneys no longer function. The person may have to be on dialysis because their kidneys don't function. Peripheral nerve damage, especially in the limbs, the arms, and the legs. The blood vessels and nerves at the back of the eyes and the retina leading to blindness. Loss of the feelings again in the limbs can lead to um, infections and amputations that may result from that, pregnancy complications. And I mentioned that maybe there is, an, is even another kind of diabetes, and some people are talking about Alzheimer's disease as being a type of diabetes as well, and they have difficulty regulating their blood glucose. So the other one here, the type 2 diabetes, this is by far the most common one. And most people, if they have diabetes, this is the one that they do have. Typically, it doesn't occur until later in life. And I say typically, at least that used to be what it was. Maturity onset is what it was also called. And it was usually people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s that would develop type 2 diabetes. Now what they're seeing is that it's younger and younger people all the time. And in fact, even in some cases, children under 10 years of age that are developing type 2 to diabetes. So in this case, insulin is there. The pancreatic cells, they are functional. They haven't been destroyed. They're still producing insulin. It's still circulating around, but the problem is that the cells are unable to respond to it. So they may have a loss of receptors or they're just not responding to the glucose anymore. So this probably results from overstimulation. Overstimulation from overeating, possibly overeating of certain foods that bring your blood glucose up really, really fast, those that contain simple carbohydrates, overstimulation of the receptors, and what they talk about is the down regulation of those receptors, and what that really means is that they're just not responding anymore, and you don't get the effect that you would normally get to that insulin, which is making the cells more permeable to the glucose and converting, converting that glucose into glycogen. Also obesity, obesity is a major risk factor for many things, cardiovascular disease, cancer, certain kinds of cancers, but also a major risk factor for developing type two diabetes as well. And some indication that intestinal bacteria, bacteria in the large intestine may also have a role in this, certain kind of bacteria may increase the likelihood of developing type two diabetes. So often these effects don't require medical intervention, at least they shouldn't. So if people do regulate their diet, sort of controlling the amount of food, the type of food that they are eating, foods that are low on the glycemic index, they call it less sugary foods, and exercising, what they say is that people should be able to regulate their uh, diabetes and their, their type two diabetes and their blood glucose, but that um, is not always going to be the case. So the third kind of diabetes, or I guess maybe fourth kind, if we do include Alzheimer's disease, is gestational diabetes. When a female is pregnant, the 
embryo and the fetus it really wants to get all of the nutrients that it possibly can from its mother and that means trying to keep the mother's blood glucose high. So there are hormones that are produced by the placenta that is the connection between the baby and the mother. Hormones produced by the placenta that counter the effects of insulin. So they try to keep that blood glucose high and uh, so in some cases about well three and a half percent as I have here of all of pregnancies females do develop diabetes during the pregnancy uh, quite often most of the time it does disappear after the baby is born but sometimes it does persist and that female would then be considered to have type 2 diabetes so finally what can we actually when you do it, someone does have diabetes some of these mention exercise exercise in itself what it does well it does a whole bunch of things it will uh, decrease uh, the chance of obesity but what it also does directly is it increases permeability increases the permeability of cells to glucose so we already saw that insulin that's what insulin does well it just so happens that exercise is the stimulus for this as well. So if you're exercising, yeah, it's going to lower the amount of glucose in your blood. Uh, diet, of course. So again, limiting what we call these simple carbohydrates, ones that are absorbed really, really quickly as they pass through your small intestine. And if they're absorbed, digested and reabsorbed really, really quickly, that also means that they increase your blood glucose very, very quickly. So eating less eating less of certain kinds of food, losing weight, and again, that goes along with the exercise diet, of course. Insulin injections for type 1 diabetes. Insulin, by the way, was discovered by two Canadians, Frederick Banting and Charles Best at the University of Toronto. So insulin is what is needed by people that do have type 1 diabetes. Uh, so these people would need to measure their blood glucose multiple times a day by poking their finger, taking a drop of blood, and measuring what their blood glucose is, and then determining the amount of insulin that does need to be injected. An insulin pump is a little bit more of a digital version where they dial in the amount of insulin that they do want to deliver, but they do still need to measure their blood glucose and tell the pump how much to deliver. There are more um, oral medications as well. For the most part, these are for type 2 diabetes, and there can be various different mechanisms by which they can lower the blood glucose. So they might, for example, uh, stimulate the beta cells, uh, increase the production of insulin. They might make the cells in themselves more um, receptive to the insulin. So there are various different ways that oral medications uh, can work, but those are just for the type 2 diabetes. Uh, what about a transplant? Well, they could do an entire pancreas transplant, but really all they need to do is an islet transplant. And this was uh, at least the best part of the procedures or the refinement of the procedure. It came out of Edmonton, the University of Alberta, and for that reason it is, yes, in fact, called the Edmonton Protocol. And really what they did refine was the drugs that needed to be given because with any transplant it will be attacked and rejected if they are not given anti-rejection drugs. So that is really a big part of the Edmonton Protocol is developing better drugs, anti-rejection drugs, making it less likely that that transplant would be attacked. Other ones are futuristic at this point. Artificial pancreas would more or less do well exactly what a pancreas would do. So with the insulin pump, as we saw, people still need to measure the amount of blood glucose and then tell the pump how much insulin to deliver. An artificial pancreas, in theory, what it would do is everything that a normal pancreas would do. Pancreatic beta cells measure the amount of glucose and they spit out exactly the amount of insulin that is required and then also respond through negative feedback to decrease the amount of insulin as well. But again, not available yet. And we'll kind of leave these last two there for the future as well. They're also in a future unit that we'll talk about stem cells, which are a reservoir for cells in your body. If something does happen to them and they become damaged and gene therapy, if there is a problem with the genes, in theory, what we should be able to do is just, well, go in and fix the problem. But as we'll see, that's a little bit more difficult than what they initially thought. And finally, this picture here, kind of similar to what we saw with the previous picture, but we're kind of starting with homeostasis in terms of the blood glucose level. What happens if you eat a meal while your blood glucose goes up? 
what happens? Your beta cells are going to increase the production of insulin. What is it going to target? The liver primarily, other cells, especially the muscle cells. I'll put that one down here. What does it do? Makes them more permeable and stores that glucose in the form of glycogen. And what that is going to do then, we're going to decrease your blood glucose to maintain homeostasis. The opposite at the bottom here is if your blood glucose is too low. So if you've been fasting for a while, then now what we're going to have is a decrease in the blood glucose. It's still the pancreas, but now it's the alpha cells that are going to be producing the glucagon, circulates around. It is going to find our target, the liver, and it's going to do the reverse. It's going to take that glycogen, convert it back into the glucose, release it into the blood, and then we're going to have an increase in the blood glucose.